Thank you, Craig, for, oh my gosh. Secondly, I have a small qualifier to what you said. Um, I think you were far more gracious than I was to you when I first met you. A um, little bit of a chip on my shoulder. Also, it's actually Claremont Graduate University, not theology. And I say that only because I am not trained to be a pastor. I am not trained to give sermons. Um, I am, however, a uh, very, very excited to invite you into, ooh, some glowing things. Oh, this is exciting. Um, so I'm very, very excited to invite you into what I actually do um, on a day-to-day -a -day basis, and that is um, look at gender, um, sexuality, race, religion in America. We're going to take a slight detour today and go to the uh, ancient Near East, um, but that's because uh, I am... Um, also trying to mark today as the first Sabbath of uh, Women's History Month. So I'm wearing my uh, notorious RBG Ruth Bader Ginsburg shirt. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Um, it's also green, which counts for St. Patrick's Day. So I feel like I'm getting double points here with the outfit choice, just going to say. Um, okay, so we are going to be revisiting an old story today, and hopefully um, we're going to take that, that detour I talked about and uncover some more stories, which is kind of what I do um, and what I aim to, uh, to study and to teach. Um, so I'm really, really excited that you're here with me today, even with the rain. Look at all of you brave Southern Californians showing up in the rain. Very impressed. Okay, so we are going to be talking about... Exodus 1 and 2, and there are five women in Exodus 1 and 2 that we typically don't cover a whole lot about. We quickly sort of get over their story because then we get to Moses, and then we get to the Exodus. Things start rolling. However, I argue there's a lot to be learned in these 32 verses in which these women reside at the beginning of Exodus. So for those of you who are not familiar with, um, I'm going to... I'm a, I'm a roamer. Okay, so we're going to roam. Um, so I, for those of you who are not familiar with the story, let's go over quickly what um, the arc of the story is. So we've got um, Pharaoh saying, you've got to kill all the newborn baby boys born to the Hebrews. We've got Shifra and Pua, who are the midwives to the Hebrews. Um, and they take after my two-year-old son and with a resounding uh, voice uh, in unison say, Thanks, but no thanks. We're not going to. Um, Pharaoh then says, okay, well, now I'm going to tell you all. We've, we're going to throw all the baby boys in the river. And everyone is, is um, in part of that decree. Uh, the biblical text tells us that everyone knows this is what's happening. So Jochebed, which is Moses' mother, gives birth to him. Really, really terrible timing. Um, I am going to be using her name here, um, except I would like to note that her name does not uh, become revealed to us until much later in the biblical text. Um, so the mother of Moses gives birth. Then she makes a basket. She places him in the river, and her and her daughter, Miriam, watch. Then we've got Pharaoh's daughter coming down to the river. She's going to take a bath. She sees Moses. She has compassion on him. Then we uh, move to Miriam, the sister of Moses, who is going to coordinate um, the mother to nurse the infant on behalf of Pharaoh's daughter, who at this point has basically signed up to take care of this kid. And then Jochebed cares for him until weaning, which we think should be about three years old. So for the first three years of his life, uh, gets to stay with mom, then gets handed over to the Pharaoh's daughter um, to be raised. I'm going to be juggling lots of things, so hopefully nothing drops. Um, so the overview of what we're going to be talking about, and I'm going to go at a, a rapid pace today um, because I don't want to um, 
excuse class on time. So, <laughs> so uh, we'll be talking about liminality first. Then we'll be talking about cooperation uh, and alliance. Uh, thirdly, bodies of resistance. And then where is God? Okay, so liminality, fancy word for we're kind of in transition. We're in between, betwixt and in between. Really fun words to throw in there. Um, so the, the story itself is in a time of transition. So the, the Israelite people are on their way to freedom, but they're not quite there yet. A genocide is supposed to be happening, all those baby boys we talked about, but it's paused. Uh, motherhood, so the two mothers in this story, uh, the Pharaoh's daughter and then the mother of Moses, their motherhood status is in flux. So basically, we've got um, Moses' mother going from mother to wet nurse mother to mother without a baby. Then we've got Pharaoh's daughter going from non-mother to mother without a baby to mother. All of that happens in the arc of this story. And then the river. What do we do with the river? Moses is found where he should have been killed. What do we do with that? Does it represent life? Does it represent death? Um, so basically, we've got a double birth story happening in this river. Um, so I'm going to like politely lay this down. I also tend to talk with my hands a lot. So, um, okay. So we've got the, um, thank you. What service? Okay. Okay. So we have got the, the first story on the left and the second birth on the right. Midwives, the first story, Shefra and Pua. We've got water for any of those who have given birth or have been present for a birth. There's lots of fluids involved. Um, then we've got mother, and it's Moses' biological mother. Secondly, um, we have got the midwife in uh, this second birth, which is Miriam, the, the sister of Moses, who's standing guard. We've got water, which is, in this case, the river. And then we've got an end of a new mother, Pharaoh's daughter. So these boundaries are crossed time and time again as we look at these women. They are able to um, create a story that truly is Disney-esque at this point. We've got the, um, the princess, the uppermost echelons of society and class. And we've got the, the, basically the paupers, which were the, um, the Israelites, the, the slave class of the time in Egypt. And all of these boundaries are crossed time and time again as we review these women's actions. We'll get into this a little bit more. Um, they, are, they, they really couldn't be more different at this point. But their shared status as women allows them their... Um, their liminality, their in-betweenness. They're not easily categorized because they don't hold power. They're neither totally in nor totally out. They are these in-between figures, and this gives them the ability to transgress these boundaries um, in ways that are really profound. Um, and so we've got um, very, very different women who are able to, in a sense, operationalize their liminality in order to work towards their own goals. So next, we've got something called bricolage. Really fancy guy, Michel Deserteau, French philosopher. It's not a proper class unless we talk about French philosophy. So we've got Michel Deserteau, who comes up with this term called bricolage, which is truly just the art of making do. We've all been there. Um, so, <laughs> especially in the last two years. Um, so we've got Really interesting ideas between strategy and tactics presented by Deserto. He aligns strategy with the powerful. So these people have all the power, all the agency. They make the decisions. They make the structures. And then we've got tactics. And tactics are more insidious. They're more um, subversive. So they are aligned with people within that context that don't have the power. Um, so we've got a, a sense of like cobbling together that allows for 
creative resistance to the repression of the powerful tier. And in this way, tactics are opportunistic, they are defensive, they are uh, agile and unpredictable. All of these things undermine strategy. So in this way, we have a very powerfully disruptive um, set of actions happening amongst these women. And they are incredibly successful. And I think this speaks to some of the, um, our own lives and, and lives throughout history where to employ these tactics to maneuver our way through spaces that aren't necessarily for us. Um, it speaks to the success of that. And we, I think, can all think of times in our own lives where we've seen this. Um, and this is truly, I think, arguably more representative of the lives of women throughout history than any other sort of category we can put them in. They are maneuvering their way through spaces that aren't designed for them by using what they have available to them, resourcefulness. Okay, so we've got uh, section number two, see? Nice pace, we're keeping this story moving. Um, cooperation and alliance, they are working together towards common goals. So I label this as a rare network of women and I do that largely for one reason. Two reasons, actually. Um, the first being women are mentioned far, far less in the Hebrew Bible than men. Secondly, they are almost always in some sort of competition with each other. They are very rarely aligning their interests and working together. We've got Sarah and Hagar pitted against each other as soon as Hagar conceives. We've got Leah and Rachel arguing over Jacob. They're arguing over babies. They're arguing over plants. Read the story. Fascinating. So it's, it's, it's a rare instance that we have all of these women together. Um, so it's worth highlighting just for that. But the first set of women we see working together are the midwives. Um, they are disobeying Pharaoh together. They are appearing before Pharaoh once he summons them to explain their actions. And the text says they literally answer in unison. They fear the Hebrew God together. It's actually unclear whether they themselves are Israelites or whether they're Egyptians. So it's fascinating either way if they fear the Hebrew God. They are given houses of their own together. They are um, named, which sounds interesting. Some, why would we care whether these women are named or not? Largely in the biblical text, many women go unnamed. So the fact that they are forever in history linked to their actions is Definitely noteworthy. Um, but these two are kind of our synchronized swimmers of the story. They're doing everything together, and they're doing it very successfully. Um, we move on to the mother of Moses, who in the text doesn't say a word, but she is incredibly active. She is birthing. She is nursing. She is creating baskets. She is leaving her child she is coordinating. She's negotiating. Incredibly active woman. Sounds like a mom, right? Um, she also has no consultation with anyone. She, the text mentions that she's married. We don't hear from the husband. She's doing this all on her own volition. She doesn't consult God. She doesn't consult her husband. Just the love and care for her child seems to be enough impetus for her to act the way that she sees fit. Um, and then we've got an incredible amount of intelligence in her story. So we're not privy to how she hides uh, baby Moses for three months. We don't know why the river, that's supposed to be the place of his death. Does she know that Pharaoh's daughter bathes there? Um, we have to kind of speculate in this sense, but that is not difficult to do when you think about what you would do as a parent. And so in this sense, I think it's fair to say that she is very intelligent, 
And her placement of Moses in that spot is very intentionally calculated. Then we've got the sister of Moses. She's a very surprising character. So first of all, we're introduced to the mother of Moses, the father of Moses, Moses. The sister's nowhere to be found. So she just literally like appears in the text. And we're like, oh, this isn't Jacobed's first child. So she is a surprise herself, and she is also surprising within the story. So she doesn't um, leave with the mom when they leave Moses in the river. She stays. She watches. She goes to the scene where uh, Pharaoh's daughter is entering into the river. She quickly reads the, the tactics that need to be employed. And um, in chapter 2, verse 7, she says, Shall I go and call for you a, a nurse from the Hebrews to nurse the child for you? In the Hebrew Bible, always, always, always important when something is repeated. So why repeat these things? Why for you? It's because she is doing something brilliant. This is a brilliant move. So she is incepting in Pharaoh's mind the idea of keeping this child, even though Pharaoh's daughter knows, we know this because the biblical text says, that she knows he's a Hebrew boy. So she's incepting this idea into her mind, and she's also masking it with this um, this idea that it's really only for the Pharaoh's daughter's benefit. Just a brilliant move. Again, she is given no direction. She is coming up with this on her own, and her reading the situation as she does forms the backbone of the entire plan of saving Moses' life. She is incredibly intelligent, like her mother, and she is... Um, uh, an incredibly subversive character in this story. And it's all the more impressive because she's yay high. She, as far as we know, is a little girl, and she's coming up with this on her own. Um, let's see here. So we've got Pharaoh's daughter. She shows compassion to uh, the child that she knows her father is um, wanting to not be alive, shall we say? Um, she is able to transgress areas such as age, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomics, class, the law. This is now law that these ch children should be killed. She's able to transgress all of those things um, through this compassion. And I think there are very few things in this life that are able to do that kind of maneuvering over boundaries. Um, the power of compassion is really important there. She herself is incredibly authoritative. She's not checking in with her dad. She's not checking in with any male figures. Um, she is able to authoritatively say, I'm going to negotiate to keep this child. And um, it's actually, <laughs> what makes it more impressive is that it's the opposite of what she should be doing. She is actively going against her father's wishes. Um, these things don't happen, um, particularly in the ancient Near East, in this patriarchal culture. You don't do anything on your own. You can't um, take a step without consultation. It's very, very insular. So we have to keep that in mind. These actions are subversive. They are intelligent. And they are uh, found in the Hebrew Bible few times, and the fact that these are all women makes it even more incredible. Okay, so now we're going to move on to bodies of resistance. We're going to get a little technical here, so just bear with me. Hopefully it'll make sense. So there's something called corporeal theory. Just means we're talking about the body, the actual physical body. Um, the body in corporeal theory is acknowledged as a site of both knowledge and power. Um, so this stands in contrast to a lot of Western thinking, which creates this sort of mind-body uh, dynamic, this binary. The mind is associated with men, and the body is associated with gender. So this kind of flies in the face of that. It really advances the idea that bodies are powerful agents in and of themselves. Um, Simone de Beauvoir, another French philosopher, 
um, she talks uh, about the body as both a material object, so the, the body that you are in, the body standing before you, and as a point of view towards the world, which is interesting because this creates the body in a way that makes um, its situation and its experience of the world equally as important. So conceived in this way, the women are able to flexibly respond to their environment, much like tactics were described a little bit ago. So they're using their body in tact, tactile and tactically um, interesting ways. So they use their bodies, their maternal desires, and life-giving abilities towards their own purposes. And this is radical because women at the time did not own their own bodies. They were owned by the men in their lives, the closest male relative, so typically the father. Um, that's why in the Hebrew Bible um, and the ancient Near East writ large, when someone, um, when a woman is raped, there are no reparations made to her. The reparations are made to the man in her life to whom her body belongs. So this is radical that they are doing this. Um, they also weren't instructed to save Moses. They were not trying to provide a son to a patriarch like Sarah or Rachel or Rebecca. They weren't trying to manufacture love. That's how Leah was trying to gain Jacob's love is by giving him son after son after son. Um, they weren't trying to gain access to a throne, um, Atalia and Bathsheba in First and Second Kings. Um, these were all ways that women were trying to use their bodies and use their progeny as ways to um, complete their own gains, complete the, go, go to um, the, their end of what they were trying to garner. Not these ladies. They saved Moses simply because they wanted to. So we can see if we, there's a, there's a process called verbing the women. Um, and this comes from Dr. Tammy Schneider out of Claremont Graduate University. She um, will go through and look at what these women actually do. So if we verb these women, um, we can see all of the times that they've taken action. Every single one of these women from coming down to Moses in the river, um, sustaining his life through nursing, uh, standing watch over Moses, the midwives, their inaction is their active bodily resistance. They refuse to do what they are told. Um, so these are some of the ways that these women have been able to use their physical bodies towards their own ends to... Um, see, see um, the fruition of their work within a context of getting what they want. Again, these are radical, radical ideas. So in this sense, we see how both accommodation and challenge are in unison in this story. Oftentimes, these ideas are paired against each other. But that's what makes this story, I think, so relatable, is that these women aren't trying to burn it all down. They aren't trying to create a whole new system. They are acutely aware of their place in society, their power or lack thereof. They know what their lives are like. So they choose to challenge what they can and they choose to accommodate to what they must. These women never step over a line that would hinder, hinder their progress, that would stop them from getting what they want, but they, again, are using these tactics to move through their own context in order to get what they want, which is obviously for the midwives to, to pause a genocide. For the mother and sister of Moses, it's to save that little baby. For Pharaoh's daughter, it's to gain a son. They all get what they want. But not because they're going to burn it all down. 
because they are able to strategically read what is happening around them and maneuver through it. So this everyday activities, birthing, nursing, bathing, watching, childcare, all of these become imbued with accommodation and challenge all at the same time. Um, Dr. Phyllis Tribble talks about um, the women at the beginning of Exodus, and she says, the Exodus faith originates as a feminist act, and the very women who are often ignored by theologians are actually the first to challenge oppressive structures. It's a very different way to look at this story. So as I mentioned, it's important to know that Shifra and Pua are named. They get their names, go down in the annals of history, attached to what they do. So what do we do with the other three women who don't have names at this point in the story? Jochebed, Miriam, we don't know. We don't know their names. They are the sister of Moses. They are the mother of Moses. They are Pharaoh's daughter. Three out of the five women don't have names. Typically, this is due to some sort of like, you know, misogynistic trope in that we don't like to recognize women for what they do. And this is historically, lots of women go unrecognized. Um, in this sense, I argue that the unnamed women are able to remain disruptive challengers in perpetuity, forever, as they live through any woman who uses what is available to her to maneuver through a structure not designed in her favor to invoke change in any small or large way. In this way, the nameless embodies all. So where is God? God's mentioned twice in these 32 verses, and that's it. God um, is mentioned as the, the thing, the being that the Hebrew, or excuse me, that the midwives fear, the Hebrew God. Um, and then God gives the midwives their own houses. They are rewarded for their disruptive behavior. After that, Shifra and Pua are kind of, in, you know, taken to chapter one. We move to chapter two. We've got the mother of Moses, sister of Moses, Pharaoh's daughter. God disappears. What are we supposed to make of that? I certainly don't have any clean answers. Um, I think the point is that we wrestle with this. Uh, but one of the things to think about is put out there by a Brazilian theologian. Her name is Ivana Gabara. If you haven't read her stuff, it's phenomenal. Um, she posits her theology in a way that is very earthbound, so not otherly world. We're not really looking towards a heaven and eternity. We're looking at the here, we're looking at the now, and we're looking at the body, the physicality. We're looking at life, plant life, animal life, ecosystems. We're looking at an incredibly biocentric and biodiverse theology put forth by Ivana Gabara. So she suggests that we look at God as the mystery of relatedness, which is underlying and pervading everything that is. It's a fascinating way to look at God. She focuses on Jesus' ministry, the actual physicality of it, the touching, the being touched by this mystery of relatedness. So she grounds her theology in this idea of God as something between us all, something existing in the relationship between people. And in this sense, she considers this, this relationship as both a language for and an experience of the divine. Completely different way to view God. So, We've got this, this absence. Ivana Gabara says, maybe we don't. Maybe God exists in this relationship between all of these women who are moving in different directions, who are working together to accomplish their own goals. One of my favorite names 
for God is Emmanuel, God with us. It's not God above us, in us, of us. It's God with us. So it's not really about the being of God or the person of God, the nature of God. It is really about location. It's about proximity. It's about the touching and being touched, that mystery of relatedness. That is where God lies with us. So Exodus begins with what appears to be a single story about Moses, the father of freedom for the Israelite people. But upon closer inspection, a much more complex constellation of stories emerge that is relevant to oppressed peoples throughout history. By focusing on the women, they reflect one another as whole beings, as whole bodies. They are not refracted through this lens of Moses that we typically get. These women are the women of many stories of resistance. And there's another scholar, Francis Landy, who says, we find ourselves written here in this story, in the touching and being touched by God. And so although these women are located in the biblical text, in the ancient Near East, um, I think in this case, they really do embody us all. Thank you.